Welcome to the Next Level American Dream podcast, brought to you by Thompson Multifamily Group. Your hosts, Abigail and Sean, will discuss how you can take your American dream to the next level through real estate investing, business practices, and personal development. Join us as we share our experiences as a father-daughter duo who are trying to accomplish their goal of financial freedom. We hope you learn more about how to define and achieve your American dream. Here's another episode of Next Level American Dream. On this episode of Next Level American Dream, Sean interviews Daryl Brooks and Kevin Hackbart from Your Value Ad Partners. Daryl and Kevin are the founders of a multifamily investing and asset management company. In their interview, they walk Sean through their approach to due diligence and asset management. If you're interested in learning more about multifamily investing, visit our website at thompsonmultifamilygroup.com. Hi, guys. Welcome to the Next Little American Dream podcast. Uh, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yep. Great. So we have uh, Kevin and Daryl here. They both uh, have an uh, extensive experience in, in construction and, and multifamily. If you don't mind just sharing with the listeners uh, kind of how you got to where you are today. Sure. I'm Kevin. I started in, I was a fireman for 20 years. And while I was doing that, we, you know, we only worked 10 days a month. So I got into single family real estate investment. So, um, and then once I got into the investment side, I started doing the construction portion of it as well. And so that morphed into doing multifamily construction. And I got hooked up with a national property management company. So I've operated in about 30, 37 states nationwide and went to a conference in about a year or so ago and decided that we were doing a lot of this work for other owners and we wanted to, wanted to uh, do it ourselves for ourselves. So we decided to start Value Add Partners and that's how the dream happened. Yeah. And Daryl, how about you? Uh, How did you kind of get started? Yeah, so I started at about age 13. My, my, mom, my mom and dad, uh, my dad was a truck driver. Mom was a school bus driver. And they started buying some HUD houses. And uh, they were at the time, they were, believe it or not, they were buying them off the HUD list for like $500, $1,000. And uh, they would go and we would just fix them up. You know, we would, dad taught me how to, you know, shingle and do all these different things and that. So I graduated high school and did a little bit of college for a while and decided to join the Navy. I uh, went to the Navy, was in the submarine service for a couple of years there, and then uh, transferred out as a Navy corpsman, transferred out to a Naval Hospital in Oakland, California. And so when I got back to Michigan after I got out, it was like four years in the service, you know, started just doing, you know, renovation stuff, started up a renovation company and that, worked doing that stuff, home remodels, building garages, decks, that kind of stuff. And then I, I got into the new construction side, and um, I was running a company here. We had 300 rough carpenters and uh, 27, or yeah, 27 trim carpenters, and we would rough and trim about seven million square feet of buildings a year. So, whatever it was, whether it was uh, renovations of old hotels and the condominiums, or renovating apartments through uh, low-income housing tax credit deals, um, building new apartments, houses, uh, build-outs and commercial buildings, you know, whatever. Pretty much seen just about everything on the construction side through there. So obviously 2006 happened and the economy here in Michigan totally went in the tank. So the company kind of limped along for a few years. And in 2012, I started another framing company, building company. And as Kevin said, we've, we've both been running these companies separate. We met last August, August of 19 at an event. And, you know, we were kind of drawn to each other because of our backgrounds. But even though they're similar, they're quite different. And long story short, we're like, hey, you know, we've been doing this stuff for a lot of other people. And, you know, we've always just been on the on the work side of it, on the, you know, doing the construction. It's like a transactional type thing, you know. Both of our businesses are that way. It's, uh, it's transactional. So if we don't build or remodel or do whatever we're doing, you know, we don't make any money. And so we were looking at this at this event. We're like, you know, we need to get in this passive side and start getting on the ownership side of these things. So we started value add and we've been building our team and, you know, working on different deals and stuff for the past year. And uh, yeah, it kind of takes us to where we are today. 
Yeah, that's uh, man. You guys have been doing this for a long time. So tell us a little bit about what what is your company? How, what's your company structured now? What what do you guys? Uh, what's your your purpose? Your your direction? What are you primarily focused on? Your your company today? Yeah, so we look for distressed properties is our main thing, and we handle the work side of everything. So whether it's you know working with different investors or people that have maybe a deal they're looking at, we'll partner up with them. Take a look at the deal, see if it makes sense. If it does, you know, move forward with, through an LOI and then into a contract. Go to the site, do a site visit, do the due diligence. Then we'll develop a, a business plan and a construction budget for that particular property. And we handle the construction management. We bring all the guys in. Uh, like Kevin says, he operates in 37 different states. He's got crews that will travel. And uh, so we can come in and we can handle all that. And then we work at the same time simultaneously, whether it's a third-party property management or whether it's our property management, we, we start working on the property management side while the repositioning is taking place. And then we can handle the asset management all the way through. So whether it's working as the syndicator of these particular deals or whether it's working with, you know, whoever the, the managing member is on these deals, we basically handle everything on that side. So our main thing is we, we partner with people. We handle the work side. We're looking to partner with people that are bringing you know, a balance sheet or they're bringing, you know, money to the deal, whether it be through, you know, uh, the LP side as a passive investor or, you know, sometimes some of these deals are small enough. It's just everyone's a GP in the deal. So it just really depends. So if someone has a, if someone has a heavy lift rehab, you guys, you guys kind of focus on that sort of thing it's, as opposed to, you know, a more stable property. You guys aren't afraid to come in and do that heavy lift because you have a, such a strong, construction background and such a strong construction business in, in a large area. Is, is that right? That's correct. And so that's basically, that's really our competitive advantage to be right. honest with you, because for some person, some generally people that think is a heavy lift for Daryl and I, it's, it's, it's not as heavy as you think. And so heavy lift, we were looking at uh, 160 units in Mississippi. That was a hundred percent vacant. Five units were burnt, five buildings were burnt down. And we were pretty much ripping everything out and putting back together what was there. That was a heavy lift. You know, people would walk away and run away from that deal, no problem. So, right. uh, but yeah, so we, we, we are not opposed to, to looking at the, a little bit more stabilized with uh, minor lifts to it because, gosh, we would, how easy would that be, Daryl? You know, just to be able to walk in and, and, you know, do that. So, but, but yeah, so that is our competitive advantage. So we can do anything from the major, major heavy lifts to just basic, you know, lipstick and functionality and property management, you know, fixing. Yeah, I think I think most deal syndicators are looking for, you know, light light value add. You know, it's, it's carpet paint and you know, a few appliances is about as about as deep as most people want to go. You know, and then they try and stabilize it. You guys are in a unique, I would think, uh, segment of the of the business where being able to do five buildings and all and re renovating the whole rest of the property, having that advantage is, is I would think would be a, a big thing. So, well, it just opens the market up for more, right. for more deals really, because there's a lot of people like in syndication that won't, that won't go after certain deals, but there's a lot of money in there. Daryl's, you know, I'll yeah. let him speak for, for himself, but I know he's said it many times, you know, there's so much gold underneath that pile of rubble that that people don't really pay attention to it and so we we generally try to hit those because it's low-hanging fruit for us you know yeah and it's there is definitely there's more to those deals that the more upside to those deals if you don't mind or if you can if you have the capacity to, to put in that effort and that energy and and can do those things there's definitely there's definitely a better upside to them for sure but most people are just afraid of them. they just you know to run a project like that is it's pretty hairy and, and scary at the same, you know. So I think most people run away from those, but that's that's a great advantage you guys have. Definitely. Go ahead, Daryl. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, on those tech deals like that, sometimes lending is a little difficult to get in place, you know, lenders, because a lot of times when we're dealing with stuff, we love stuff that's like 50% occupied. It allows us to turn units faster. Generally, it's not just the property. It's also the property management that's a problem. And it's not always the property management so much as you have a property manager sometimes that's unsupported by the owner and meaning that they aren't given the resources to be able to manage the property correctly with, you know, the, the budget that they need to make that. Because those buildings, they, the operating expenses are way off the hook. They might be 60, 70, 75% because 
you know, you're putting band-aids on everything. Stuff continually keeps breaking. And so, yeah, when we come in, we look at, that's one of the main things we look at when we're looking to turn these properties is how can we reduce the operating expenses in here? Because um, if you reduce your operating expense by a dollar, it's an actually do, it's an actual dollar in your pocket, as opposed to raising the rent by a dollar, you're only getting 50 cents or whatever, whatever your operating you know, expense is. That's what you're getting. What's left of that, you know, minus your debt service. So, you know, when you can reduce your operating expenses, especially like on repairs and maintenance and stuff like that. Yeah. So some folks just aren't, you know, like you say, it, it scares them. They walk into that and see something like that. And they're like, Oh my God. You know, I remember my wife, the first house we turned, she walked into that and she was brand new to this stuff. And she was like, are you kidding me? You're going <laughs> to yeah. do what? I'm like, trust me, honey, it's going to look beautiful when I'm done. So, you know, it, it was funny, uh, you know, so when you see the look on those people's faces like that, you know, it's just like, uh, when you don't know, you just don't know. And so, yeah, and that's, that's what, that's where we come in. And that's where we like to partner with people that maybe they have a deal like that in their backyard. And they've been, you know, it's been sitting there for a while and they're like, man, you know, I really like to take a look at this, but I don't know where to start. So that's the importance of partnering with people like us or, you know, other people. So. Yeah. And that's the secret. You know, I do the same thing in my single family business. I, I don't have a strong construction background. Like I've never run a construction company or anything like that, but uh, I've looked at a lot of properties and, and I've done that in my business too, where I buy a house. I, I bought a house one time that I couldn't get people to go into it, you know, to look at it. So, wow. you know, they were just, they were just, it was so bad, you know, Sure. We, I ended up picking up for like a thousand bucks and we put, we put like 85 grand into it, sold for 135,000, you know, made, you know, made a couple bucks on it. Sure. But it was two weeks from being destroyed by the city. It was condemned, you know, but it was a beautiful little three, two brick house, you know, so if you can find the, the, the diamonds in the rough like that, you know, it, you can, and now there's a nice little family living in this beautiful home that's living right. out their American dream, right? So that's really the, the payoff for, for, for doing those heavy, those heavy yeah. projects like that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to keep going down this path almost, but I would like to talk to you guys about due diligence, if that's okay. I think that's a topic that's fascinating to me. It's a little bit of a, I don't know, kind of a behind the scenes topic that a lot of people are aware of all the details of it. So if you guys don't mind, maybe describe to me uh, what you think, of, you know, what due diligence is and what you guys are looking for in your due diligence and, and what, you know, kind of what are some of the things uh, that um, you're trying to pull out when you're doing due diligence. So, so let's start with, First of all, what is the due diligence process? Well, I, I think first of all, it's better saying what it isn't. You see a lot of people posting videos out there. Oh, we're out walking this property, doing our due diligence. It's way yeah. more. It's way more than that. And yeah. so, don't think that's what it is. That that's not what it is at all. And we've been doing a series on Friday, kind of kind of exploring different phases. So you've got like different phases of the due diligence. So you've got what I call like the pre-due diligence, which is the stuff that you can find out about the property before you actually ever go to visit it. You know, you can see what the taxes are. You can call the building department. You can find out if there's any outstanding violations against it. You know, you can call the tax assessor to find out if I buy this property for X, what is the tax, what are the new taxes going to be? Because when you purchase this property, the tax rate is going to change. What's on that pro forma is not correct. There's, you can get a hold of your insurance agent, find out what's, what's this going to cost for insurance purposes. You know, you can do some calling around, you can do some Google reviews, some Yelp reviews, see what the reviews, see what people are saying about this property. So you're not walking into this thing cold, you know, it might look like something that's a gem, but you know, I mean, it's, it's got a horrible reputation, you know, it all, you know, it all adds into what you're doing. And then you kind of got like the, you know, what I call like the preparing for the due diligence. And that's the things you need to take with you in order to be able to actually perform this. So if you don't have a strong construction background, you need to call ahead and you need to get a hold of like a roofer and, you know, electrician and, you know, plumber and stuff and have them meet you out there to walk the property or at least some of the units with you so that you can get a professional opinion about what's going on. People always throw a number out like, well, it's going to be a light lift. It's like three to 5,000 or it's kind of a moderate lift, seven to 10, or maybe it's a heavy lift that's 15. Who knows? You know, if you have somebody out there that has some hard numbers, you're, you're literally just throwing, you know, stuff against the wall. You got to do that. So some of the other stuff, you know, get a camera, you know, don't use your cell phone. You can use a tablet, I guess, if that works for you. Sometimes a drone comes in handy if you have that available, you know, to you. Flashlight boots, boot. And this kind of thing, you need masks. Having boot covers is another nice thing to put in your pocket. Uh, sometimes if they have carpet in there, they 
don't want you trouncing through there with your shoes on and stuff and keeps you from having to take your shoes on and off. And, uh, you know, basically have a checklist to go in there. You know, you're going to have to get, you know, a layout of the units and some measurements of things that you need to, need to know to kind of put, start putting some numbers together. And then we try to set up some meetings with people because when we go do our due diligence, we're not there for, you know, a day or half a day or whatever. We're there for, two, you know, two, three, four days, depending on the size of the property. So we try to get meetings set up with the uh, building department, um, economic development, chamber of commerce, tax assessor, yeah, police department, fire department, you know, all these folks that we try to get these meetings set up with before we go out there so that we can, you know, make the best use of our time because you need to talk to all these people. And then there's a physical actual inspection that we go to. So you want to make sure you get into every unit, you know, property managers, um, if you're dealing with a property manager versus a seller, yeah, I've been, I've been on once before. Like I walked one in Cleveland once and I actually ended up walking the property twice, one for one investor and one for the other one. And when I went back the second time, I was insistent I have to see every unit. First time I went in there, I told them I have to see every unit. So I get in there and they're like, oh, we only had six people that allow us in the unit. But when I went back the second time, I found out why they wouldn't let me in these other units because they were destroyed. You know, floors were ripped out, broken out. You know, plumbing was a mess. It was just a nightmare. So it's important to get into every unit. You know, you can't take people's word for it. You got to walk every unit and that takes some time. And, you know, once you have your basic measurements down, you know, the other units you're looking for gross things that are out of line. You know, is there mold growing in a corner? Is there ceiling leaks? Do you see discoloration in the ceiling from a, a unit above it where the plumbing's leaking? Um, if you see faucets dripping, you know, just things like that. Those are the things you want to document because it helps you to develop a, a, a fair price to offer on this building. And uh, yeah, at that point there, then we, we always try to make friends with the, the property manager and the maintenance person if there's one on site. And a lot of times Kevin and I will take them out to lunch, we'll take them out to dinner. And we just want to, you know, kind of befriend them because, you know, the more they kind of get to know you a little bit, the more they start to open up and they know where all the bodies are buried. They know where the problems are with these properties. So if you can develop that trust with them, they'll start spilling the beans. And uh, that's why I like to do it without the broker there or whatever. Just the brokers over there, you know, they're, they're less likely to kind of open up a little bit. So that's why we try to take them out to lunch or dinner. We always ask them, you know, hey, uh, what would you do? What, what would make this property really stand out? And what would make it, e what would make your job easier? You know, it gives a lot of insight. You know, some people say, man, if we had new kitchens in this place, I could lease these things up faster than you shake a stick, you know. And then other times, you know, you, you hear some real horror stories. So it's kind of crazy. But, yeah, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. I don't know what, what do you want to add to it, Kevin. No, that's basically that's basically it. You know, it's just a matter of there's, a, like you said, there's a pre-due diligence and then there's actual due diligence. You know, you get all the, all the numbers, all the rent rolls, all that stuff. But then once you're out there on site is, is really looking at, uh, you know, all the mechanicals, all the, all the big majors that are going to cause the most problems and uh being able to get in every unit you know and and really just you know taking the time out there to to look at all that stuff because the one thing that you forget to look at is the one thing that's probably wrong and that's going to cost you the most amount of money that's a fact so you know, and then there's the other side of it too there's the paperwork side um you need to go and you need to review every lease and you need to compare it to the rent roll that's been provided we ran a property there and we got in there and you know there were 300 leases to look at took two days to go through them all, but there were security deposits that were whited out on the lease. And, but on the rent roll, it showed that there was a $300 security deposit. So it's like, well, what's right? What's wrong? You know, move in, move out dates. If a person's month to month, you know, things along those lines, you want to really go over that whole expense, you know, portion of the, of the P and L or the balance sheet there. It, it can have some real clues. If you see on there that, you know, Harry's plumbing is out to that site 10 times a month or something. They're paying 10 times a month. It's a pretty good chance you got some sewer issues out there. And you might want to think about actually bringing somebody in to actually camera the drains because those are something that can get really expensive, you know. So it kind of gets into digging in, even in the pre-due diligence when you're kind of picking apart, you know, the paperwork that they send you. And there's a, there's a saying, you know, buyers are liars and sellers are worse. So, you know, it's, one of these issues where you really have to dig deep into that stuff and they'll complain and they'll, they'll, they'll carry on about it, but you know, you just need to do it. And the other thing you want to see is you want to see what kind of contracts exist on the property. Is there a laundry contract? Is there a garbage contract, landscaping, cable, 
uh, there's there's all kinds of third party vendors that have contracts that don't necessarily go with the owner they're with the property and so when you buy that property you're going to inherit that contract and you need to know that because um, we've looked at properties where the guy's getting absolutely hosed on a laundry deal you know he's not getting his fair portion of it and you're stuck with that contract or you get a cable contract you know that's was poor and uh, you know it can make a big difference and if you've been at this any time at all you know, if you can raise, if you can add $10 a month to a unit in a decent area, like say six and a half or a seven cap, what, what that $10 more a month does to the valuation of that building is absolutely massive. Right. Yeah. Same. Likewise, if you take $10 away because you've got a bad contract. It's yeah, bad. absolutely. Yeah. So I'm just going to recap some of that stuff for you guys. So the pre-due diligence is kind of what I'm doing today. We've underwritten this property. We've kind of taken a glow, you know, a 30,000 foot view of the financials. Uh, we think we can, we think we can make a run at the price that they're asking for it. Uh, I'm going to go walk the property now. They're going to show me a couple of the best units that they have on the property, of course. And, and I'm going to kind of get a, give an assessment of the property, uh, for CapEx. That's, that's re, that's the reason I'm walking the property today. I yeah. might talk to the property manager a little bit. I will definitely talk to the broker. Uh, but I'm looking at, uh, my assumptions that I'm making in my CapEx estimates and my underwriting are those fairly accurate based on what I'm looking at? You know, if I, if I show up and the, the, the roofs are terrible and the, the parking lot's terrible and the pool's empty and, and green, or, and then I walk the units and they're just trashed, I know I've got to adjust my CapEx estimate on my underwriting in order to make an offer that's reasonable and, and that's going to protect me when I actually go in to do full due diligence, which is, like you said, walking every unit, you know, mm -hmm. and walking, walking the entire property, bringing out the specialist, getting all the inspections done. So, and then you, you know, like you said, the financial audit is a big deal as well. You want to check every, everybody. I was going to ask you, do you guys do, uh, do you requalify the existing tenants uh, when you take over a property? Well, uh, one of the things you have there is, I mean, you just lease some place. So when you take those over, other than if it's like a, a section eight voucher, a lot of cities, if it's a section eight voucher, if the ownership of the apartment changes, then that kind of breaks the lease and, and you would have an opportunity to maybe reevaluate them. But when you're buying the property, you're kind of buying it as is. So the leases that are in place, you're kind of stuck with. And with the COVID stuff right now, you know, the eviction ban on non-payment of rent, it's important people understand that. You can't evict somebody for non-payment of rent. It doesn't mean you can't evict them for other things. If they're breaking a lease, you know, illegal or illicit activity going on, they're a nuisance, you know, any other, any other thing. You can still evict people. You just can't evict them for non-payment of rent right now. So yeah, you're, yeah, kind, of, you're kind of stuck with those leases and you know, it's always a good idea. Yeah, it's always a good idea to, you know, ask them if they want, you know, hey, you know, this is what the new units are going to look like. You know, would you be interested in signing a new lease, you know, to get one of these type of apartments? And there's a way we have of being able to actually able to do the unit with leaving the tenant you know, in that unit where they don't have to move, you know, to a different unit because it's kind of a hassle if you're trying to get somebody to move, you know, from one, you know, one apartment to another, not just because of the move, but more because now they got to change all their paperwork, driver's license, got to contact all their creditors, you know, change of address stuff, junk like that. So, yeah, so yeah, the other thing is yes, yes, you would. And then you can, then you can uh, compare it you can compare it to what their existing history has been. And then that you can use to your advantage to say, you don't generally meet our normal requirements, but you know, due to your history of what you've done with this property, we're looking at upgrading and moving that. So, you know, everybody has a bad day, you know, but, but yes, you do requalify them. Yeah. That's one of the things I like is because you want to find out, a lot of times the, the existing property management, one of the issues they're doing is they're, they're accepting tenants that may not fully qualify for what you're going to be doing with the property. Correct. And so to, to know kind of who's in those places, you know, when you're, when you're trying to make these upside improvements uh, and who's going to make it through that process is important. So, you know, requalifying the, 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 doing the background check, the credit checks, you know, that kind of the basic stuff on the tenants, I think uh, the existing tenants, I think gives you a picture of where you're going to be headed or who's going to be, maybe not make it through the cut, right? In terms of uh, upgrading, upgrading units and things like that. Well, let's talk about, so that's, that's a lot of information. I hope everybody kind of caught all that. I tried to recap a couple of points there, but that was, there was a ton of information there just go through. 
So you guys are looking at just the, the construction, the construction issues that you're going to run into. You're looking at any sort of the financials that are going to be quirky in, in, in their books, existing books, and then what the real, real picture looks like. Let's talk about some of the. I wanted to uh, add any service, yeah, any service contracts that are in place. You definitely want to check on those service contracts, such as the washer and dryer service contracts. Some people have purchased properties where they're on the hook for, you know, five years and they didn't even know it. So, and they're grandfathered in to when the property sells. So you definitely want to make sure you look at all service contracts that are in place as well. So verify the, verify the information given to you by the existing ownership with the company that's providing the service Correct. to make certain that what the ownership understands to be the case is the, the, what the service provider also understands to be the case. That's right. right. You definitely yeah. want to do that because you'll pigeonhole yourself into having a contract that you're not making any money on. So. Yeah. So if you do have those cable contracts laundry, or uh, I guess they're called called clothing care contracts now, the, those different things. If you have those things in place, you want to definitely get those get contact information, contact those uh, providers, and make sure that uh, what you're seeing is what the, what they expect to have happen as well. Definitely. Let's talk about some of the mistakes, the common mistakes people are making as they go through this. Uh, I, not the maybe not the front part, but the the, the due diligence part. What are, what are some mistakes that you see people come to you guys, I guess, or that you've noticed uh, people overlooking and, and ended up costing them, you know, down the road? Most of the time, most of the time, the things that I've seen are, are people underestimating their rehab budget, not having any contingency in place for unforeseen. I mean, when you, even when you look in every single unit, you can't open up walls. You can't, you can't really do too deep of a dive you want you want to try but i definitely think that there's that was a big you know not having a contingency amount in place whether it's five percent ten percent contingency of the total budget just for any unforeseen and then the other thing that i've seen is not taking the extra not taking the time or not wanting to incur the cost of like having a plumber come out and snake the drains to make sure that it's that they're clean and functional and there's no issues or problems that you have to replace, you know, getting the right, you know, called MEPs, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing, getting the right people out there to make sure that everything is good and functioning correctly. Generally that incurs a cost and people don't generally want to pay that cost because if tenants are living in there, obviously it's working or their tenants wouldn't be in there. So they just kind of move on to the next deal. So, those are two of the bigger things that I've seen that, that you know, Daryl probably can elaborate a little bit more on a couple things, but those are the main things that I see that cause the most dollars and cents damage to the budget. Yeah, so people okay. have come to you and said, hey, this is, my, this is my rehab budget, and then when you go to actually start construction on the property or the project, you're like, wait a minute, your rehab budget should be here. We've got Definitely. these other, we've got Definitely. these issues. And then so the other case could be if you're, if you're trying to squeeze that rehab budget too much and you come in and say, Hey, we're, we're over budget. The other thing that you just, you just have no room. Like you said, even a contingency, you have no room if there's anything that went wrong. If there's a wiring issue, if there's a plumbing issue, some of those things okay. that you can't see, uh, if you don't con have a contingency in the financials for that, then, you know, where do you go? Right. Where does that money come from if you didn't plug it in there? So, exactly. and, and those things can be expensive. Exactly. And then the other thing that I've, that I've, we've seen a lot uh, is especially transitioning from single family to multifamily. You know, the, the single family contractors generally are different than the multifamily contractors. So, you know, single family, you're getting, you know, price per square foot and single family is completely different than multifamily. In multifamily, there, it's a combination of not only getting it for a respectful price and a, a below average or average price, but being able to complete it timely and have the capacity to, co to actually complete it. You know, using a single family handyman on multifamily is not necessarily the way to go. Actually, it's not the way to go because you will lose your ass on doing that because those guys just don't have the capability or the experience or the availability to be able to knock out a 150 unit or even a 50 unit deal. You know, you're going to spend twice as much on time, which is going to reduce your operating income. 
and you're going to probably end up spending twice as much money as opposed to just paying more of a commercial retail price to getting it done. So Daryl and I have always said we're not the cheapest, but everybody we have, we've vetted and we've used nationwide. So we know that they're going to get the job done from start to finish. And that is the most important thing. And we, our prices reflect, are not like I said, are not the cheapest, but they reflect the fact that they are competitive pricing that gets us to the finish line. And that's what you need because if you have a 300 unit or 150 or a 50 unit property, that's three quarters of the way done, it's going to show, you know, so, and the quality is going to show. So definitely make sure that your contractors or your subs are, are familiar with multifamily. That's a matter of scale, right? So the guy who's used to coming in and doing a one house, single house project rehab, he's just not really equipped with staff or just understanding on how to do six units at a time, you know, sure. every, every two weeks getting these things knocked out or whatever it takes, you know, sure. and then moving on to a new building. So the scale of it is probably just not something that a single family a contractor would be prepared for having the staff and, and just the equipment and, and the, the knowledge and, and, you know, being able to just do all the, the, the scale of a, a larger project. Is that what you're saying? I am. That's exactly what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And one of the other areas that people, you know, really fail on is, is that, you know, not having a good business plan, not having a good construction or renovation or, you know, repositioning plan, whatever you want to call it. So in other words, they go in, they've been to some seminar and they tell them you got to do this, this, and this. So they go in there and they go, okay, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Well, the market might not support that. It might not be something that, you know, you can do, you know, as far as that goes, you might not be able to, the hard surface, you know, countertops, and you might not get the money back, or you might just be overdoing it, you know, resizing the whole building. I mean, just all kinds of crazy stuff you can look, you know, you can look at. It gets back to kind of the construction budget because you can put too much money into these units too, you know. That's another problem people sometimes make is they put too much money into them, and it just takes too long to get it back out. You know? So a great business plan, knowing what, you know, knowing what the area is going to require in order to, to attract the best tenants is what you're looking for. And so you, that's what you want to do. You want your units to be better than everybody else's, but not by, you know, 100 feet, 10 feet bigger, you know, 10, 10 feet better or whatever. You know, you just want them to be something that's going to, you know, set you apart from the Clean and functional. Yep. And, uh, yeah, and I, I think another issue is velocity of, of work, right? So how fast can I get this property remodeled? How many units can I do every day or whatever? You know, how fast can I get through this project? And you have to sort of scale that out, right? Your, your, your construction company is only going to be able to do these projects at a certain pace. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're expecting to do a 150 unit remodel in a month and a half for, you know, that's just not, there's no way that's going to happen. And if your financials are, are anticipating that, then you're, you're completely, you know, in the weeds already. Right. So I think part of your, like you're saying, part of your business plan has to also include, you know, how rapidly can we kind of get these turned over? You know, how, how, you know, how, how does that going to work? What's that going to look like? And what's the timelines? And, you know, so that's, that's a, a good point and that you want to make sure your plan includes, you know, the timelines of things as well, too. So that's, right. I think that's a big issue. And you got to work with the property manager because, you know, you come into a property, say it's 85% occupied on 100 units. You got 15 down units you can work on where you can get in and blow them out. Well, those other 85 units are going to take a longer period of time to reposition. And so, again, during the due diligence, that's one of the things you want to be looking at is how many people are month to month? How many people, you know, how many leases am I going to have expiring in the next 30, 60, 90 days? So you can build that into your plan because you can choose not to renew the lease. If the person doesn't want to upgrade to a new apartment, they don't want to pay the increased rate, then you just don't renew the lease. And then they move out and you're able to go ahead and, you know, get that unit into the thing. So like Kevin was saying and you were saying, you know, you need, you need a crew that can come in and blow stuff out like the bacons real quick, but you also need to have a plan on how you're going to turn these units. Are you going to turn them with your maintenance people? Right. Are you going to turn them with a turn contractor? Are you going to turn them with, you know, the, the guy that did the, you know, original stuff? And, and, and it gets, gets into the planning again. You have to have a plan of how you're going to get all these units turned over what period of time. And, you know, occupancy slows that down. There's a way to do it. 
And like I said, we, we've got a way we can do it where the people, <clears throat> they don't have to actually physically change apartments. They got to move out for a little bit, but um, it's not usually a long period of time, like three days, four days. Right. Yeah. Well, that's good, guys. What else should people kind of be sure to address in their in their due diligence? Is there anything, is there like any last thoughts on that we didn't cover yet? Well, I think at the end, you got to take all the information once you get back from your walk and everything and you've done your heavy due diligence and you know, you got to put, you got to put the whole puzzle together at that point and find out if that offer that you made in your LOI is still a, leg a legitimate offer. As you know, they, put, they call it retrading and brokers hate it. Everybody hates it, but it's a thing. We had a deal. We looked at a property in February up in Illinois, snow on the ground, stuff like that. We went back to walk it again in like March, May, I think it was May. And uh, well, the concrete was total garbage, you know, and so it was something we weren't able to see. So that was something new that we, you know, didn't see from pictures, whatever else, how, how bad the concrete and the porches and that were broken up. So we had to add that back into our budget and had to go back to the owner and say, look, you know, this is what it's going to cost us. We, you know, we're fair people. We weren't looking to try to get him to cover everything, but fortunately for him, he split the cost with us. And so, you know, there, you have to take that information. Once you've done all this, you got to take it. You got to put it together into a package and find out if that LOI where you're, you know, before you go under contract or if you're under contract, you know, if it's something that needs to be adjusted there because of something you discovered during your, you know, your due diligence. Yeah. It fits within your business plan that you, that you know, you can execute that business plan Definitely. Um, and everything that you, everything you put in the business plan is, is not, is we want to make sure that you didn't miss anything, I guess is what you're saying. So that's good. Yeah. Well, the name of the podcast, guys, is, uh, you knew this already, but <laughs> Next Little American Dream. So I always like to ask everybody, and both of you guys are clearly kind of living out your American dream, it sounds like. What do you, what do you guys sort of define uh, your American dream as? And then maybe if you can, share a couple things, if you have them, that you uh, think you do to make your, your American dream kind of next level, if you don't mind. Either one of you can start. My, so... So what my definition of the American dream is, is that, is that correct? Yeah. Well, to, what is the American dream for you? And, and, and what is it that you're doing with, with your American dream? And then if you have maybe a couple of suggestions for people that, that you do, maybe you read books or I don't know sure. what it is that, that kind of helps you level up your, your, your work and towards your American dream. Yeah. For, for me, the American dream is being able to not, not have to worry. I was a fireman for, you know, 20 years and, and now I'm, now I own my own business with Daryl. And so, you know, there is a, and with COVID and everything happening, there's that, that sense of security that you can get from changing from uh, an eight to five Monday through Friday, having that security to starting your own business and making sure that income is coming in. My goal is to be able to make enough money to where I don't have to worry. And my kids never, I have two daughters and they never have to worry and they're able to dream as big as they want to and money will not actually hold them back. So they'll be able to have our, our job, Daryl and I's job is to make this a legacy for our families. And so we're, our hopes are is that our kids are going to eventually get into to doing what we're doing now. And if they want to do something else, that's great, but they'll always have this to fall back on as a, as a lifelong you know, uh, nest egg for them to, to learn and understand so for me, having that availability, I don't want to be rich. I just want to be able to live the life that I want to be able to live and have that sense of security to where I never have to worry anymore. Even when COVID comes around or the next thing or the next election issue that comes up, you know, I never want to have to worry about that, you know. And for me, some of the things that I do, because there are, and Daryl can attest to this, we've been doing this for a year, you know, and there are days that are worse than others. Yeah, and and there are times that were, you know, not necessarily for me, not for me, and I know not for Dale. There's no give up, but there's like, man, this sucks. You know, like it's not things are just not working. Things are not going the way that they supposed they're supposed to do. You know, you know, Dyson was one of those guys that said that if I it took me four 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 thousand two hundred and ninety-eight times to come up with the Dyson vacuum, and if I quit 
at 4,287 that I wouldn't be worth $4 billion, you know? So, you know, you know, just keep on, you know, keep on pushing and keep on living the dream. So one of the things that I do is I don't let, you know, negative blows, you know, keep me down. You know, I always look for the positive and, and, you know, you know, kind of put, put it out to the universe and hopefully that everything is going to, you know, go the direction that we want. And, and, you know, I have a vision board, I have things that I want and things that I need. And, but, you know, we try to, you know, better ourselves with going on podcasts, with listening to podcasts, reading books and things like that. But we are definitely living our American dream. We, and I've, and I've said this before, Daryl and I love what we do. Like we really enjoy real estate. We really enjoy meeting new people, partnering with new people and traveling to these cities and meeting different folks. And, and so we really enjoy that. So you, you really want to, you really want to take what you're doing and really, you know, give 110%, you know, you know, I think, who was it, Daryl? Somebody said, you know, I, I spend 80% of the time, but 80% of the time on something that makes me 20% of my money. You know, you need to, you know, really get involved with this. And, and, and like I said, we love it. And, and so, so yeah, so what we're doing now is, is our American, is our American dream. It's the, it's the only, it's the, what did I say? It's the way to, it's the lottery ticket that I have a say so in, you know, this is my lottery ticket and I'm able to dictate the direction that, that, if, that I'm going to win the lottery, you know? So that's to me what real estate is. And that's the direction that we, that we both want to go. So. That's good. Yeah. How about you, Daryl? Well, first of all, America's the greatest country out there. You know, if you haven't been out of this country and I'm not talking like the, you know, England or France or Italy, Spain, stuff like that. If you haven't been to like a third world country, Central South America, you really can't appreciate what you have here. I tell people all the time, if you were born in America, you won the lottery already. But this is definitely still a land of opportunity. You can do and be whoever and whatever you want to be if you're willing to get the education and put in the work. You know, and that's I think the part that people miss a lot is, is you know, it's not, people aren't going to hand this to you, you know. You got to go wrestle it like a like a damn cow wrangler, man. <laughs> and sometimes you got a big old steer with some nasty ass arms, and sometimes you know you got the little calf. But you know it's tough. It's it's not something easy. And it's uh, like Kevin was saying, you know, there's days, man, you get punched in the gut, and it's it can be very deflating. And that's what's great about having a great partner like I have with Kevin. You know, if one of us is kind of like you know whatever, kind of licking our wounds that day, the other guy's like you know shut up and suck it up, man. Let's go. You know, whatever. We don't we don't cut each other much slack when it comes to that. We don't surround ourselves with, you know, who you surround yourself with makes a big difference. And, you know, um, you got to surround yourself with positive people. There's there's tons of people out there that, you know, will tell you how, you know, tell you many ways that you can't do this, you know. And um, there's so many different examples of how persistence pays off. And that's just it. You know, you have to work at this every single day. And Kevin said it. We love what we do. So it's not something that, you know, I mean, it's work, but, you know, since you love what you do, it doesn't feel that way. We're always, you know, whether it's looking at deals or, you know, meeting new people or visiting new cities and seeing what's going on there, looking at new apartments. And I mean, when we go in there, I mean, it's like, you know, the brain's going a million miles an hour about how we can do this, how we can do that. What do we got to do here? You know, we're already just, you know, analyzing everything as we go through it. And, you know, I think we all do this for the same reason. You know, people say, oh, I'm not doing this for the money. Well, that's BS. We're all doing it for money. You know, I mean, um, that's that's part of the thing. But I think when you dig a little deeper on it, you, you understand what it is. And it's either, you know, you're doing it for your family. You know, if you have uh, wife's kids, uh, you know, whatever the situation might be, grandkids or whatever, you're doing it for that. Because I just had a conversation with my oldest daughter the other day, and I said, you know, the education system's designed to make us model citizens to go fit in our little peg and stay there and follow the rules and get a job and be a good productive member of society. And that's all fine and well. But at some point in every family's life, the families that have excelled in this country, somebody along the way has decided to take a risk. 
and decided to step outside that box and decided to take on that challenge. And for most people, they, it didn't happen the first time. <laughs> you know, there aren't too many guys out there that said, oh, yeah, I had this great idea. And, man, I became a multi-gazillionaire. You know, no. Most of the time, there's, there's, there's a process of, you know, setbacks and things like that. So you have to be persistent in that. But I think we all do it for the same reason. And it's, it's our families. We want to be able to provide something for them that maybe takes this family to the next level. And then what I love to see is how, how our kids can take and parlay that that we built on and take it to something even grander than what we were thinking, you know, because the hardest work is getting it off the ground, you know, and uh, keeping that ball rolling. You know, I, I tell Kevin the analogy we use is that, you know, we're pushing a stone up this mountain, you know, and we get to the mountaintop and I'm like right now, when we start pushing it, I can see that mountaintop. I know where I'm going. I know how to get there, but we still got this big stone. But once we get over the top, you know, it's like, and that's where a lot of people quit. They're like, oh man, I made it. Well, for us, I like a short valley, and then we're pushing the stone up the next mountain. Yep. And we just want to get it on up there and on to the next deal. Not that we, you know, we finish as strong as we start, but, you know, it's a situation where you got to have a clear vision and some plans and some goals to have that direction. And don't be afraid to really have some crazy, outlandish, just, I mean, you know, I look at stuff like Elton, you know, like Musk and, you know, some of these other guys, some of these ideas. I mean, Jeff Bezos is a prime example. When Amazon started up, people said, what the heck is this guy doing? And he's losing money every day. You know, now, now look where he's at. So don't be afraid to dream big dreams and try to think outside the box. Try to, you know, try to find those ways that you can separate yourself in this multifamily world because it's a small world out there. It's not as big as people think. And the Internet has made it much smaller through podcasts like this and just, you know, different things like that. But I guess the other thing I, I love the most about what we do, and I, I love what we do, is just the people you meet along the way. It's so interesting to see how some of these people have made money, how some of these people, where they've come from, the struggles that they've had. It's, it's, it's a joy when you're talking to like a, an owner of an apartment property. This has been their baby for 30 years. It's fed their family for 30 years. It's very special for them. And uh, it's just amazing. I just love hearing people's stories about, about, you know, how they got where they're getting and what they're doing and where they're going and stuff like that. And I love to see people succeed at whatever it is. I love it when I see somebody, you know, somebody takes down a deal. I'm, I'm like, heck yeah, man. I'm clapping for them because somebody else can do it. I can do it. You know, and we need more of that to encourage one another. Yeah, it's kind of a competition. You know, some of the areas, it's a lot of competition. People are fighting over these same properties and stuff. But, you know, there's a ton of properties out there to do. So, you know, we like to meet as many people as we can and find out how we can work together to help each other crush those goals that we all have and just build something bigger than ourselves. So, Yeah, that's good. I think so. You got. I don't know if you guys know my story, but my daughter works with me now too. So she's still going to college. She's in her last year of college. She's studying finance with a specialization in real estate, and nice. she has a minor minor marketing. So she's kind of tailor made for this business. But she's so she's she's my partner in the in the multifamily business that we have now. And my wife also works in the business. So I I understand your family legacy uh, concept there. That's <laughs> my whole family's in this business. And I'm, uh, you know, ho the hope is that you build something for your children that they can then take to the next level, right? So All day. Okay. if I can get it here and they can get it here, that's even better, right? Amen. So I, I get that quite a bit, yeah, and, and I, I, that's definitely about where I'm at as well. That's beautiful. Well, um, guys, I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and sharing some of your experiences and knowledge. You know, you can tell you guys have a strong construction uh, background in, in what you do, and uh, I really thank We're you for coming on. I'm up around the edges. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I just you, see, you guys talk. I can tell you're you're specializing in construction, but yeah, we're, we're we're very transparent. What you see is what you get. We don't, you know, we're not putting yeah. on masks and being pretenders, you know. So this is what. No, that's good. We are, so it's good. So authenticity yeah. is important. Yes, sir. Uh, I was also going to say, you know, one of my one of my things in my life is is every day. You know, I tell myself every day, you got to show up every day. Amen. And that's what you, both of you guys mentioned that, that you, you know, you get beat up a little bit, but you just got to show up every day and keep pushing okay. and keep pushing. So that's, that's right. good to hear you guys say that. Makes me feel like I'm in the right path, right? You're doing yeah, the right absolutely. path. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. My it. daughter, they're 10 and 12, and maybe I could talk them into a finance with real estate because some of that stuff is tedious. If I could have my daughter just handle it, that would be awesome. So well, you know what happened was, I'll tell you if you guys have time, but I'll tell you. Sure. 
So uh, what happened was my, my daughter went to, to school. I, you know, I, I uh, talked to her about going, going, going to college and all those sorts of things. And she went into finance. And then she said, she came to me one day and said, hey, I want to I want to travel between she was thinking about going to law school after after this time period and, and she said i want to travel and i said baby uh, you're, you're gonna you're gonna need to figure out how to pay for that because i'm not i'm not paying for it you know right and uh, and she said she said well that's why i'm talking to you i want to i want to learn some of what you do you know and, and at that time i was in the single family game and uh, so we started talking about it and i and I, I had been wanting to transition into multifamily so i said well, why don't you just join me and we'll build it together you know so that's that's kind of how it happened so there is time for your daughter to, to kind of come yeah. around I'm oh, yeah. <laughs> she wasn't interested in my business at all until she got into college and started to see what was going on in the real world. And, right. uh, you know, and I still ask her every time I see her, you know, have they taught you how to make money yet? She's like, no, you know, so <laughs> l- luckily awesome. she has me to teach her how to make money. They, they, at school, they teach her the technical issues, you know, technical stuff. And so, it's, which I, you know, I can't teach her those things, but I can teach her how to make money. So that's, she's right. got, she's got awesome. the best of both worlds. Absolutely. So yeah, there's still hope for there's still hope for your 12 and 13 year olds. So. That's awesome. I'm ready. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks guys. I want to have you back on, and we'll talk about asset management, some construction stuff. If you guys have time sometime in the future, you know, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll keep this conversation going down the road if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And and you can get a hold of us. Anybody that's watching can get a hold of us. You know. Right. Yeah. Where uh, where can the people find you guys? So our website is yourvap.net, Value Add Partners, Inc. It has our phone numbers and, and uh, email addresses on there. Uh, we're also on Facebook. I don't know if we're on Instagram. That's kind of out of my pay grade. So, and LinkedIn. We're also on LinkedIn. But, uh, you're fine. Yep. Yourvap.net. You'll be able to find everything about us. And, and we'll be updating that, that website uh, with our stuff that, as we progress. So yeah, anything, anybody has any questions or if they just want to have us look at some of their deals and just kind of give us, you know, uh, give us, have us give them our two cents. We'll be more than happy to do any of that stuff. Yeah. For sure. I'm going to be contacting you guys. I've got a couple of properties that I've been passing on just because the, the, the lift was a little bit too heavy. So I might send it to you guys That's and say, good. Hey, I'm ready. Yeah. Especially let's let's Texas, take a look at this. In Texas. It's on then. I got yeah, guys, exactly. You know, hundred guys here, we can knock that out with. So, yeah. Well, Daryl, Kevin, I really appreciate it. It's great to talk to you guys. I'm I'm really happy we got this time. It's great to get to know you a little bit. Yeah. And hopefully, yeah. hopefully, some people got some information out of this, and and we'll get you back on the show to talk more about the other stuff. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so very much. We really appreciate it. Good luck today on your walk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. All right. Good day. Talk to you guys soon. Thanks yeah. again. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Bye now. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Next Level American Dreams. If you would like to learn more about what we talked about today, want to contact the team directly, or are interested in passively investing and being a part of our deal room, head over to our website at www.thompsonmultifamilygroup.com. Before you go, please leave a review. Your comments help us create more episodes for you to enjoy.